Yeah, greetings everyone. Peace, peace to you all. It's Chief Yu, y'all. You know, I wanted to share something um, real quick that I came across yesterday, and it, it was um, related to my latest podcast, which was episode 70 that I did, uh, New Life. And in that podcast, I was speaking about the the um, effects or the effect that the um, death of, the, uh, of Queen Elizabeth II has had on some people who I would consider to maybe be um, moving around with, with and holding on to the legacy of colonialism and uh, have somewhat of a colonized mindset. And I, I came across a video and I said, man, it's, you know, um, with Muta Baruka that I'm going to share. And of course, <laughs> you know, anything I can explain, he can explain it far better. <laughs> but, you know, it was um, so interesting, you know, that um, he had touched upon the exact points that I had hit, you know, in the podcast. So I thought it was really great uh, in terms of reinforcing what was shared. And, you know, some of the things that I just spoke about, you know, and it was just a small section of just really speaking about the colonized systemic, um, what we'll call self-negation, which is really what, you know, moving around with that colonized um, mentality is, is um, when you're accepting that domination and that control over you by groups or um, individuals, and, and they may control your resources, they may control your behaviors, they may con control um, your territory and you're allowing that legacy to promote a level of um, discrimination you know as it may pertain to race or or class or sex or you know just just different um, areas that 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 um, group seeks to hold over uh, the disenfran disenfranchised uh, racial groups you know or other sorts of groups so that colonial or colonized mindset is is an internalization of oppression, uh, whether it's during the time of impression or oppression or after colonization, where uh, those who have been colonized they come to a place where they believe the ethnic and and racial and cultural uh, inferiority that's uh, been implanted in them by by the colonizer. You know, and as a result, they tend to separate themselves from their culture. They separate themselves from their history. And, you know, often this, this may express itself as a dislike of their natural hair, a uh, dislike of their um, skin tone, uh, which we have colorism, you know, a dislike of their bodily features, you know, and they, they may tend to uphold the beauty standards of the colonizers. And, they may even express a certain level of aggression against uh, those of their own people who maintain the natural order, whether it be an, uh, the, the um, natural order and the original order of how they spiritize, you know, their connection to their God or their connection to their body or their connection to the earth, their connection to their family, so forth and so on, how they maintain their relationships. Sometimes um, the colonized will approach individuals who move like that with um, a certain level of hostility, you know, and it's usually because they, they're suffering from PCSD, you know, which is post-colonization stress disorder. And that will express itself through certain thoughts, certain behaviors, certain uh, feelings, certain symptoms within the body. And you'll have certain racial macroaggressions and, and microaggressions and you know it's a bit different from you know like PTSD uh, which may be a, a normal reaction to certain stress stressors that are ongoing or um, you know but this is when you're deal, dealing in a I'd say a racist socio-political context you know and it's it's an ongoing thing you you begin to develop different consciousness to survive you know if you will and you don't really get through it until you learn to begin to integrate your historical and your cultural roots into your identity and that brings that level of empowerment and self-esteem and positive self-regard and you know uh, so many other things that will begin to tear apart the um that that mindset that colonized mindset you no longer accept 
the uh, your own inferiority or or look for the, the, the blind approval of your superiors or your colonizers or anything like that, you know, you, you begin to come to, to sort of come into a place where you don't feel inferior. You know, you don't feel like you should be controlled by some force uh, that never shows respect towards you. You know, you, you're looking to leave that disrespectful relationship. And there are there are models of um, those who have expressed um, the need for that. You know, people like your, your um, Jomo Kenyatta's uh, in Kenya or um, your Namdi um, Azikwe in Nigeria, your, your Kwame Nkrumah's in Ghana, you know, who really sought to um, immortalize an idea and a movement of Afrocentric pro- uh, posterity and um, really sought to kind of, um, you know, um, you overcome the colonizer mentality and overcome, overcome the colonized uh, mentality through uh, dislodging the colonizers from Africa, you know. Uh, so there, there are, of course, other people, and, and so many people have been colonized, you know, Spanish people and, you know, um, Latin people and, you know, we could, we could kind of, Australians, you know, um, you could just go through the list. So that was just something that I had brought up in regards to the death and how people reacted. I even brought up uh, the British invasion of, of India and um, how significant that experience was there, too. But um, even with all of those calamities that occurred there um, at the hands of the British and the disconnection of power, you know, that the those those Kushites had there, um, even though the, the, colon, the colonialism there, as far as that active force was inherently un, unsustainable, um, it still merged itself into the, the psyche of the of the population, um, and eventually rebellions happened. And I brought that up in in the movie RRR that I suggested, you know. And I'm again hoping that <laughs> Brother Low will, uh, Brother El Karar will do a um, historical breakdown for us, you know, so we can get to a uh, yeah, we can get to a common understanding with some of the things um, that happened in that region. You know, um, but yeah, you know, just that way of thinking, it, it affects the the thought of the original person. You know, it, it dilutes the perception of, of our culture and the, and the complexities of what we could be in modernity, you know, um, or, uh, excuse me, modernity. And we start to develop this um, this longing and this this nostalgia for sometimes a romanticized pre-colonial life without real study you know we 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 see this colossus of this oppressor that's over us and then we have this idealized perspective of what we were before the woes uh that the um colonizer brought to us so there's so many different angles to approach it from but like i said i just wanted to share a little bit and i wanted to share this clip man because um you know, uh, as some of you who've been um, supporting and taking in the information that I've been teaching for years, you, you've probably noticed um, I don't I don't reference a lot of people because a lot of people who are out here calling themselves teachers are not such, you know. So um, there's a few names that I'll bring up and I tend to bring them up often and you'll hear me say, yeah, Muta Baruka. You know, again, one of um, very, very similar to uh, Shahrazad Ali, one of the people who I I would always sit at their feet, you know, as my elder, you know, and take in what it is that they have to share as a part of my growth practice, holistic practice, psychological approach and um, part of my practice of, of healing the wounds in my spirit from racial trauma you know, um, and decolonizing, which for many of us is, is a lifelong uh, sort of exercise, if you will, healing, acknowledging first and then healing from the trauma, you know, going through that grieving period where we can identify, yeah, um, we've endured some hurts, man. You know, there's some things that have happened and being able to listen to the wisdom and the knowledge 
of people who've been exploited by those systems and how they've come through it and being able to relate and engage in our own cultural representation with humility and start to take up our own spaces to participate in what we do, you know, and then begin to invest or include people who've been maybe marginalized in our de- in, in decision making that helps us and, you know, repairing the psychology for those who um, need to heal from the suffering and and also preventing future hurt is what all of this is about. So we can eventually then finally <laughs> have, you know, solidarity and work towards um, within our own group, uh, racial equity and, and coming to a place of emotional s- stabilization and um, assessing, you know, the desensitization that that sort of happened within us and reprocessing some of our negative experiences and, and things like that. You know, all the therapy that we sort of have to have to go through in order to regain an Afrocentric spiritual worldview and to have our emotions and, and our connections and our root and our history and our culture and our knowledge, you know, validated so we can promote our own spiritual development and the own way our own ways that we offer resistance to colonization and how we affirm ourselves and how we connect and 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 how we have faith and and our own agency you know we can promote the liberation of of such components within us all right so i'm just going to share this video and willfully you all have subscribed to chief you your podcast through apple or google or twitter or Deezer, it's on Spotify too. Wherever you want to get it, it's all over. Wherever this podcast is there, um, and you've had an opportunity to check out episode seventy. All right, um, yeah. So that's that's what I wanted to share. Like I said, I I, I saw the video and I was like, man, that's that's timely, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, yeah, man, Muta is like, you know, the tw- he was referring to the twelve days of mourning in Jamaica, which I had spoke about in the podcast. It's like, you know, 12 days for what? <laughs> like, you know, so, uh, yeah, not not to. Well, I mean, I can't say not to offend. I mean, the idea of celebrating um, a war criminal is, is offensive within itself. If you really look at it um, from proper perspective with critical consciousness and centering on your own identity development. And if you're properly engaging in a sociopolitical action. You'll see the the mental illness that's inherent in an idea like that. All right, so I'm gonna share the video. All right, now, check Jamaican it out. Poet, musician, uh, your response to the death of Queen Elizabeth and also of the British Empire's relationship to Jamaica. Good morning. Um, I am totally agree in, in agreement with the, the first speaker and. I don't even want to go back into slavery because a lot of people claim that Queen Elizabeth was not responsible for what her ancestors did. She herself said that slavery was legal at the time, so she don't really recognize what we in the Caribbean is talking about. Now, we have to realize in 1952, that was when she, she ascended the throne of England. And if you check the history between 1952 and now, you will see that even though slavery was abolished, but they, what we call it, redefined slavery and called it colonialism. And colonialism in this part of the world was represented by the throne of England. So we're not really talking now about that individual person. We're talking about a, a corporation, an institution, which is called the Monarchy of England, that has totally devastated a lot of the progress we could have made if it wasn't for this what we call colonialism interpreted to us as slavery still. Now, we have to remember in her time, there was the Mama uprising, which is a very interesting case because she was actually named Queen of England when she was in in, in, in Kenya. And the, the cruel and wicked things that the British army did 
to the African people there cannot be seen as just, okay, that is just something. And she has never, never granted any sympathy or say anything that would say, well, you know, she have a kind of art to what was taking place. We look in South Africa during the apartheid system. The British is part of that wicked apartheid regime that devastated and killed thousands of Africans who was fighting for right to be a person in South Africa. And it was not, it was recently, even during the time of Mandela and Win Mandela, that we was told that they were still on the list of terrorist groups. And even though England and this queen was ruling at that time, there was no effort to find out what is it they can do to help to alleviate the problems that confront African people in this part of the world. Now we come to the Caribbean in this time. The Caribbean has been devastated. We know in history, one of the richest plantation owners, keen owners, was a man by the name of William Beckford. William Beckford got his riches and became one of the richest men in England in, in that time. And up to this day, when we recognize how much people died because of the institutionalized slavery that they call colonialism, up to this day, the, the, the movement of a people, in the, especially in Jamaica now, where our constitution was given to us by England through the hands of the so-called um, Bustamante and, Man, and, and Norman Manley, who was recognized during that time in 1962 when Jamaica was supposed to be getting independent. They went to England and they got a constitution that is now part and parcel of what Jamaicans are supposed to live by. And when we look at that constitution, it does not include ownership of land in Jamaica by the people. If you go into the courts of Jamaica, it says the Crown versus Tom Stroke or the Crown versus John Tom. That is what we have to face right now. Now, when you recognize that Jamaica is supposed to be an independent city, it's country, most Jamaicans say it's Jamaica not independent. That even though people say it's like a it's, it's not rich, it's not really governing the country. But the head of state, the head of state is the governor general um, representing the Queen of England in an independent country. How the hell that, can, that is possible? That you have an independent country that is the, 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 the first lady is the governor general wife, not the, not the, 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 the prime minister's wife. And they set and designed the constitution that way. And these so-called, we call them bossy slaves, jacket and tie slaves, that they continue to uphold and maintain that regime that has committed so much atrocities and crimes in this century, in this time. They have been commenting it and still commenting it. And we don't see why we should now sit down and say 12 day and morning. That to show how backward and how what we call the Stockholm syndrome has grabbed our leaders in the Caribbean. That here's a, here's a family that represent criminal activities of your ancestors. And now you start to love them. How, how is that possible? How is that possible that we who know the history is keep repeating the history? We know what is taking place. In, in this democratic, so-called democratic country that is still honoring the most gruesome and cruel monarchy that ever exists. And we know of it. How can we now sit and say, we're going to have 12 days of mourning? 12 days of mourning for, for, for what? What we're mourning that far? Why we never, we're not mourning for the thousands and millions of people that died across the Atlantic Ocean. We're not mourning for all the, 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 the warriors of our time. There's no day for Taki. There's no day for Nani. 
all of these people who died because they stand up Mo and struggle to get out of the class of British colonialism. Mutabur we now sit and say, we must mourn. I am not one of them who is mourning, and I can talk for a lot of Rastafari, Virgin and Sitrin. We don't see it as a mourning time. Muta Baruka, I um, wanted to ask your response to Charles at the time, Prince Charles, just a few weeks ago, praising the contribution of Jamaicans to British life as immeasurable in a message commemorating Jamaica's 60 years of independence from the UK. Um, now you have Jamaica also talking, like Antigua and Barbuda, of a referendum um, on complete independence, on becoming a republic. Uh, what would what do you think the outcome of that will be? And what would reparations and an apology look like to you? be adequate right. for you. By right, the way, first, it's an honor to speak with you again after so many years having years, talked to you yeah, in Brooklyn. Years, years. Yeah. All right. What he's saying is what we expect him to say. You now, actions speak louder than words. And if he is here now to do certain things, he must understand how we feel as African people in this part of the world and what his family and ancestors did. So to address the situation is not just to say why he feel bad about what is happening. That is not apologizing. Because he did that already. He came to the Caribbean and said, why well, I feel bad about what, what was happening. We need somebody saying, look here, we see what happened, and we was responsible for it, and we're sorry, and we're going to make amends. And the amends come with what we call it, what them call um, getting something going between the, the governments of the different countries to facilitate reparations and repatriation. Because we're not taking that out for those who desire to go back to Africa because we came to Jamaica not by free will, but by force. Nobody asked to come to, to the Caribbean. None of these Africans, at least my sister, never asked to come here. So the Rastafari community is crying out say, reparation, repatriation, meaning that those who are desirous of going back to Africa must be able to do this without the argument about commonwealth of nations. And that is really an hindrance. There is no moving away from the queen and the monarchy if the countries that claim getting rid of the monarchy is one. But if you still in the Commonwealth of Nations, that still bind you and grip you to the same colonial system that you are trying to break free from. There is no getting rid of the queen or getting rid of the king, and you're still into the Commonwealth. We as Jamaicans, there's a lot of grandfathers and who's living today who fought in the Royal Air Force during the World War II and who get, went to England to help build up England. And what we hear now, first of all, Jamaicans have to have a visa to go to the so-called motherland. Jamaicans is not allowed to stay there at a certain length of time. And now we have the Windrush people who just recently, we see that they're trying to send back people who was in England for 60 years and have children at them house and everything. They're sending them back to Jamaica. That is one of the most racist thing that I have ever seen in my lifetime. 